country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John responded to God's summoning. And welcome to worship on this bright and sunny day, this fourth Sunday of Advent, as we uh, continue our, our study of John the Baptist. Uh, welcome to uh, worship to our internet viewers who are joining us this morning uh, on this uh, fourth Sunday of Advent. So, are you ready for the last stretch? <laughs> it will be a busy week for most of us. Take time. Take time to breathe, take time to soak in the love that God sent down for this time of year. i like to take this time to personally thank each and every one of uh, Mount Olivet Church for the awesome Christmas gift that Joanne and I received 
uh, at the parsonage in our mailbox. I regret that I forgot to mention it last week. I didn't get it out of the box until Saturday, and Saturdays are busy for me. But I want to tell you that uh, every time that we gather together, I consider it a gift uh, to join together and to share God's love, uh, to learn more of God's love, to to ask those important questions and to, to learn together. So, uh, once again, thank you very much. I invite you now to join me with our call to worship today. <clears throat> A righteous branch will grow up from the stump of Jesse. He will bear his will bring righteousness and the fear of the Lord. He will bring peace and justice. The wolf and the lamb will live together. The lion and the cat will live together, and the little child will live together. They will not hurt or destroy anywhere on God's holy mountain. And would you join me now with our opening prayer? Lord, we have come to this place from a world of demands and schedules. We have sought hope and love and joy and have found them here. Now we seek the inner peace that only your presence can bring to our lives. Open our hearts and our spirits to your love. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, and I'll be reading Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 14. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then, the crowd asked. And John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share the one with one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? And he replied, do not extort money. And don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. to God. So I invite the Jones family to come up and uh, lead us through the lighting of our fourth Advent candle. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Do we have a moment of silence? The Son of God comes to us as the Prince of Peace. He sends his messenger to prepare the way. On this fourth Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of peace. We eagerly await the day when violence and greed come to an end, when God's Spirit brings down the powerful 
and lifts up the lowly. We pursue compassion and kindness, turning to God. We seek to be a people prepared for the Lord. I invite you to stand as you are able, and we sing hymn number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. The words will be on the screen. So if you're wondering, yes, that is an illustration from last Sunday because John continues to preach. <laughs> so our gospel, second gospel lesson this morning is from the gospel of Mark. And I'll be reading Mark chapter 6, verses 17 through 29. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a, gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guest. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath. Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. 
the man went, beheaded John in the prison and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. May God bless to your hearts the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Eternal God, the words that you give us today are difficult. May you be with us as we reflect upon these words. We ask this in your name. Amen. Exactly one week from Christmas. What a pleasant lesson that we have before us this morning as we complete our Advent journey of 2022. Adultery, lust, murder, all in the space of a single column in our Bibles. The context of that reading uh, is that Jesus, just before this, has called his 12 disciples and have sent them out in mission, a mission of evangelism. They were sent forth with literally nothing more than the shirts on their backs, with the assurance by Jesus that those that received them would care for them and house them. In the middle of this, Mark has injected the narrative of Herod's atrocity. When I was in junior high school and and too young to be able to get a job for the summer, I worked around the house and took care of a list of things that were compiled for me by my dad and my mother. They would sit down and decide the things they wanted me to complete and maintenance around the house over the summer. But I actually got paid for it. Uh, And actually, during those years, I even paid what my mother called uh, uh, room and board back to her. (laughs) It was a lesson lesson for me uh, that uh, not everything is free, and that everything has value. Now, mother was a full-time housewife, and I will not say that she didn't work because she did. And so during those summers, we would have lunch together, soup and sandwich. I loved tomato soup. Mother always mixed it with milk, not with water, so it was extra creamy for dipping your sandwich in it. Sometimes I long for those simpler days of lunch with mother and and tomato soup, and black and white televisions. (laughs) Sitting on one corner of the kitchen table, we had probably about a 10-inch portable black and white TV. Lunch began every day when the theme song for The Guiding Light (laughs) played on that TV. We'd sit down and eat, and I actually bought into the show. I I got very interested in it, and and, I couldn't wait for lunch. And no matter what I was doing around the house, I kept on my watch, and I didn't have to wait for Mother to call me. I showed up. I got hooked on the guiding light, watching it with Mother. When I went back to school at the end of the summer, I couldn't wait to get off the bus and almost run that half a block back to the house and come in and ask mother, what happened today? Did so-and-so do this thing he said he was going to do? How did they react to it? Years later, I found myself sitting on a sofa with Joanne 
in the front of a color TV. <laughs> Friday nights, as we became fans of Dallas. <laughs> and together set in amazement of the plotting of the Ewing family as they pursued their, their passions and their individual agendas. At, at recently, uh, in recent years, I, I would be tempted to suggest that J.R. Ewing was a contemporary version of Herod. Our interest in Dallas led to the purchase of our very first VCR so that we could record it. Yeah, it sometimes seems to be a part of our human nature to become fascinated with plotting and planning that is such a central theme on soap operas. It was amazing to see those twisted and contrived thoughts play out on a TV screen. The characters were focused and very deliberate in their actions because they were in pursuit of their passions and personal agendas. Herod's passions and agenda include power and lust. Herodias is Herod's brother's wife. She's also Herod's niece. And Herod's brother is still alive. There is no provision within Jewish law that would validate Herod's marriage to Herodias. In fact, the law specifically prohibited marrying your brother's wife. This marriage is an adulterous one, if not incestuous also. Herodias craves power also. And she must have seen this marriage as some way to promote and advance her own agenda. It comes with no surprise that Herodias has a grudge against John the Baptist because he's been traipsing all over the countryside, preaching that this was an illegal marriage and preaching that it should be dissolved. Her daughter, Salome, is dancing in front of Herod. And I think we can read between the lines of the scripture and assume that she was doing it in a very suggestive way. Certainly when you consider what Herod's reaction was. But I wonder if maybe we can even see Salome, at least in part, as a victim herself. Because she's being used by her mother Herodias as the vehicle to to draw this promise of some sort of tremendous gift from Herod, but instead uses his fascination in her to ask for the execution of John the Baptist. On this last Sunday of Advent, we cannot overlook the force of evil that is present in the sinful plotting that we have before us. John the Baptist's execution forces us to to take a look at a world of corruption and power, a world that Jesus came to save, came to save as the promised Messiah that John the Baptist preached about. You know, evil works in uh, the hearts and minds of individuals as it it drives uh, self-centeredness and it draws its victim into an existence that leads to pain inflicted on those around them. It it creates a sense of self-glorification in its victims. The kind of self-glorification that we see in the mass murders of today's contemporary world. What other than evil could drive these individuals to enter schools, theaters, public places, houses of worship, 
and gun down innocent people. Evil rears its ugly head even in the lack of response to these murders. Our inability to legislate reasonable and life-saving gun control laws. Every living soul on this planet is of sacred worth. Every living soul on this planet is of infinitely greater value than the inconvenience of waiting or being denied a gun purchase. We can't deny that evil does exist. The Apostle Paul writes in his letter to the church in Corinth, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit, we have strength and power for us to resist evil. So where's the good news? Where do we find grace in the midst of adultery and murder and lust? Can we? Some would say that absolutely there is no good news in this biblical soap opera that we have before us today. But I believe that the good news can be found in what I call the grace of choice. These despicable acts that are carried out by Herod and Herodias, they're the result of choices. Choices made by the players in our narrative today. Herod made a choice to succumb to the evil nudging of Herodias and to have John the Baptist murdered. The good news is he had another choice. He could have let John the Baptist go free. Mark records that, that, that Herod had been moved by the words of John the Baptist. Uh, he was puzzled by them, but he liked listening to John the Baptist. What is this force that would bring Herod to pause? It would bring Herod to a time of reflection as he had a conversation with John the Baptist. I'd suggest that it was God's presence. God's grace with Herod. Our own Mr. Wesley calls it prevenient grace. It's that grace that is present with us even before we know of God. Even before we are seeking a relationship with God. And maybe that's the missing good news from this dark passage that despite, or, or maybe even because, of evil stranglehold on the world, God is ever-present in our lives. All we have to do is reach out to God. All we have to do is to respond to God's summoning. Now, the tragedy in this morning's narrative is that Herod chose to turn his back on God and on John the Baptist, and to choose a path of destruction. In following the narrative of John the Baptist's advent, I think we can agree that when God breaks into the world, it is in ways that are unfamiliar, ways that are radical, that bring us to radical decisions. Because God is not of this world. Now with our human imperfections, uh, the choice is not so simple. 
choose the world with the promise of instant gratification as Herod chose, or, or choose to become disciples, to be the disciples of Jesus Christ, along with the inherent struggles and dangers that are highlighted in our Gospels. Now, yes, I know our, our context is very different today, right? It's very different than that of Herod, of John the Baptist, but has it really changed that much? We can choose the path with gains that vaporize in a fleeting moment, or the path that leads to eternal life in the presence of God. The grace is God never forces God's self on anyone. Instead, God offers the grace of our choice. And this, I think, is the heart of what we await in Advent. We long for the one that, that came first as a child, as a servant, the one who will teach the world what it looks like to enter the kingdom of God, the one that will teach the world we have a better choice. That's why John the Baptist came to proclaim by name he was summoned by God. It says that the word of God came to John in the wilderness. By name, John was claimed by God to prepare the way. His preaching and his call to repentance of everyone and separation from this world's forces of evil brought him in conflict with those who were in power. John risked his life for the truth and in the end gave up his life for the truth. But he died knowing that he had fulfilled God's purpose for his life and that the Messiah had come in the incarnate person of Jesus Christ. As we leave Advent behind and we begin our journey to that joyous birth, Evil and injustice might prevail for a while, but they don't have the final word. Justice and destruction of evil will ultimately prevail. And on this last day of Advent, we pray, come Lord Jesus, come. Illuminate the darkness. And to God be the glory. Amen. Take a deep breath. The next hymn is a fast one. It'll test your endurance for the coming week. I hope to see many of you multiple times this coming week. And I pray for a joyful journey to Christmas morning. I leave you in peace. Let us pray. It's almost Christmas. Thank you for another week of preparing for this season. We ask for so much. We just need to slow down to enjoy the real reason for this season. We need to be reminded about the real reason for Christmas. It isn't about the shopping for the perfect gift. It isn't about rushing from one program to the other. It isn't about how many parties we attend. It isn't about how much baking or meal prepping we do. It's about getting our hearts ready to receive the biggest gift of all the birth of our Savior. Thank you, and thank you for loving us. Thank you for the youth. God, and be beside them this afternoon as they prepare for the program. 
calm their bodies to help them to deliver the message of the program. We ask for special prayers this morning for the family that are preparing to say goodbye to their loved one. The road has been long <clears throat> and overcome in joy for a while, but it's time to let go of their loved one. We thank you for Pastor Tim and Joanne, the dedication they have for our parish. We ask for safe travel so they travel from one church to the other. This coming week is a busy time for them. We pray that they will take time to enjoy their families. Be with those that have lost the loved ones. We pray they find peace. Thanks for the caring of the sick. Continue to be with them as they heal. Be with, be with each of our church members and families as they go about their week, keeping everyone safe and sound. We ask you to be with fam families that are struggling to get through the Christmas season. Touch us if there is some family that needs help. Thank you for the offering we receive. Amen. <clears throat> now we'll rise for the benediction. The most beautiful way to start and end a day is with a grateful heart. Amen. Go now in peace.